first three years were stark terror, and the last three years were sheer boredom. Yet that experience, a brain aneurysm, and three divorces have left him filled with song, proof of the resilience of the human heart. The essence of life is overcoming adversity. The walls of the Museum of History and Art in Coronado are filled with lessons of perspective and survival. And these men are all testaments to the fact that you can, you can survive tragedy, you can get over adversity, and you can make a life for yourself on your own terms. Be prepared. That's nightly news for this Friday. Veterans Day is Monday. Don't forget. I'm Tom Broker, and I'll see you back here then. I've had the pleasure of interviewing 30 of these gentlemen. There were a little bit, a little more than 700, I believe, who originally who came home in '73. We have with us Colonel Bud Day, who you all met previously in the con in the uh, conference, who spent uh, a a long career in, in the military, retired, and is now quite an active lawyer, and his wife Doris helps him out in his law practice. We have Captain Jack Fellows, who is a retired Navy captain and taught at the Naval Academy upon his return from, from Vietnam and is now a tireless volunteer in Annapolis uh, because he tells us that his wife says he has to be out of the house during the day. Um, we also have with us uh, Colonel Tony Marshall, who when he returned from Vietnam, uh, finished out his military career, and is now a captain with United Airlines. So if you have any customer service complaints, you can direct them to, to, uh, <laughs> to Tony. And then we have Major General Ed Meckenbeyer, who actually was one of the last Vietnam POWs uh, to retire from the military, and he finally retired two years ago. Is that about right? That's about right. And he works for SAIC, a defense contractor, also does lots of motivational speaking, and is also, you'll, if you go to air shows around the country, you'll find him as the, uh, the MC. So I'm going to ask a series of questions to each of these men. Each one is directed at one of the panelists. I'm hoping that when he answers the question, he will also tell you a little bit about himself in the process. First question I'm going to ask is to Colonel Day. And I'm hoping, even though I have described some of these great lessons that we can glean from these men's experience, but I'm hoping that he can tell us specifically what lessons did you bring home from the POW experience that you shared and used with your family and your personal life and also professionally. I've been waiting for a long time for this opportunity. <laughs> Uh, the, the major lesson I brought home from Vietnam was with the great adversity comes a great opportunity. I certainly uh, did not uh, like my POW experience, but I learned a great deal from it about my enemy, uh, both foreign and domestic. Um, Dr. Sarley, thank you so much for your marvelous analysis of uh, how that war went. Your book is absolutely splendid. I ask it, no one leave here without buying Dr. Sarley's book. And I say this because <clears throat> it fills in the absolute vacuum that all of us sitting here uh, have. We did not know after reading the books that are out there uh, what happened when those authors got through. And Dr. Sorley fills that gap in and explains to you how things went under just General Westmoreland, then uh, over to uh, General Abrams, and then to the disaster that followed. Uh, what I brought home from there basically was the need to stand up to the plate when the opportunity is there. And I look at Jack Singla about here, a friend of mine from uh, the campaigns that we were involved in, another one of those stand-up guys who, when the time was right, he stood up, just like these two little crews. <clears throat> when they said, who will go? They said, send me. So what I took away from there was, first of all, <clears throat> the very marvelous uh, work that the, those 160 POWs who preceded me in jail, the marvelous things they had done, how they got the system organized, the resistance effort that was going on, the great uh, caring for each other, the 
maintaining of the standards that we were supposed to maintain. Uh, it was just marvelous to see that. <clears throat> because of the brutality of our captors, a lot of times a lot of things happened that you just had no control over and things didn't go the way exactly that you wanted it to do. But over that long <clears throat> period, uh, things came out well. POWs came out of there with the most important thing they could do, their heads up. Uh, and for that, I'll be ever grateful. And I also want to make a comment about Jack Fellows here, who picked me up after 101 days of torture and uh, kept me alive. I think it's interesting that Colonel Day mentioned stepping up to the plate. Uh, many of you may not know that in his work as a lawyer, he actually represented a group of veterans and filed a class action lawsuit against the government that went all the way to the Supreme Court. So he saw a need, and he did step up to the plate and was an absolute tireless fighter in this class action lawsuit for more than six years, seven years? Is that about right? Five years and seven months, is that what you said? To be exact. So he is still active, works about six days a week, I believe, and he and his wife have four children and 12 grandchildren, Yes. and a grandson who just returned from a second tour in Iraq, is that right? Yes. yes. So it's the pay it forward concept. The next question I'd like to ask, I'd like to direct to, to Tony. I'm interested, as a lot of people are interested, when I tell them that I did some work with POWs, they all brood and say, oh, that must be very depressing. And I say, actually, it's quite inspirational. They say, well, then, you know, how many of them are, are, are homeless? And I say, uh, zero. But there is a lingering question about how the POW experience affected you physically and emotionally over the long term, if at all. Some of you may know that the POWs participate in medical studies. There is a center down in Pensacola that sponsors yearly physicals for these men and their families if the families are interested, in, or the spouses if they're interested, so that they can track their physical and emotional well-being over a long period of time. And it's interesting in some of the, the results in the studies that I have seen, they actually compared it to a, a, uh, a group of naval aviators about the same age who did not, were not POWs. And there's some interesting comparisons about how they have fared physically and emotionally. Uh, the divorce rate is about the same. Um, and what the POWs, their, uh, their physical injuries in terms of broken bones and broken back and muscle problems from ejection, they're suffering more from that than they are from, say, heart disease. Um, because as a lot of them said, you know, while we were tortured, we also had pretty clean living. We didn't drink or smoke for six or seven years. So they said there were some unusual and unexpected residual benefits, if you want to call them benefits. So Tony, can you tell us what about, how did the POW experience physically or emotionally change you, if at all? And how did your quote unquote recovery compare to the prevailing stereotype that exists out there about the Vietnam veteran and his or her readjustment after the war? Okay, first I'd like to See if Ed would like to take that one. Oh, you guys are going to switch. That's right. All right, we'll have. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Um, I'll, I'll add my two cents. Of it. There we go. Okay. I was going to defer a little bit to Ed because he had a much longer experience than I did. Um, my experience there was fairly simple. I got there in the late summer of '72, sort of the summer help. Uh, Things had changed quite a bit by the time I got shot down. 